Hello and welcome to another edition of the SBK Betting Podcast. This is the final episode of our daily Cheltenham Festival pods. I really hope you've enjoyed them throughout this week. If you didn't know by now, I'm Tom Collins and to my left is Ross Miller. Well, that's it. The 2023 Cheltenham Festival is history. All four days over, 28 races done, and we've seen some fantastic horses along the way. There have been any numbers of thrills. Fortunately, not too many spills, albeit a couple of dramatic ones, on Friday. And I'm sure you felt the rollercoaster of emotions that both Ross and I have throughout this week. Now, we'll briefly talk about Friday's action before highlighting our favourite moment of this year's festival, picking out a horse to follow for the rest of the season and into next year, and then we'll talk about Saturday's racing as well. So let's get into it. We'll start with the Cheltenham Gold Cup and Galapin de Champ proved that he is the horse everyone thought he could be. He romped clear of Brave Man's game to win by seven lengths. Four favourite backers, Willie Mullins, Paul Townend. He's just a superstar, isn't he? Yeah, absolutely. When when absolute class meets stamina, that's what you get. I mean, I've watched Gold Cups for, for a long, long time now, and that is one of the most exciting and competitive I can remember seeing for, for a long time. Run at an unrelenting gallop with a hoist in your setting, really strong fractions out in front and jumping brilliantly. Your heart has to go out to connections and to him. You know, he's been a scrappy jumper in his career, probably the best round of jumping he's put in, and he still ended up on the floor, having jumped poorly before and not ended up on the floor. But he forced a really strong gallop, and I think a Gold Cup is all about stamina and class coming through, and you need a, a strong pace to be set. Um, I thought it was a brilliant piece of riding by Paul Townend, as AP McCoy and Ruby Walsh really cleverly highlighted on ITV racing, you know, he was perhaps a bit further back than he wanted to be, and he was cool and calm and navigated his way through. And to watch him traveling down the hill, still swinging away, to join in with the other class horse in the field, the King George win a brave man's game, and, and ding dong it out up the hill over the final two fences, I thought was exactly what a Gold Cup should be. And he stayed absolutely every single centimetre of, of the trip. I've seen a few people on my Twitter feed, in, including a judge whose opinion I, I do rate, suggest that Brave Man's game perhaps didn't see out the trip. To me, he, he stayed it. He just didn't stay it as well as uh, Galloping Deschamps. You know, uh, Noble Yates, the, goal, uh, the Grand National winner, who clearly stays very, very well, was closing at the line. But I thought Brave Man's game ran a great race. And, and, and another horse I got wrong. I didn't think he would any, run anywhere near to that level. Um, and you have to give all credit to Paul Nichols and Harry Cobden. Yeah, I completely agree with the sentiment of uh, Hoysen. You're taking um, the race to the other horses. And he was going really well at the time of falling. He probably wouldn't have got close to Galopin de Champ, but for him to fall at that stage was heartbreaking. Um, the fact that he went hard early meant that a couple of other horses couldn't even go the gallop, Statler being one, who I was on anti-post, and I know you were as well, Ross, and he just never showed up in the race. Manella Rindo was done from an early stage. I think Aplutard was also at the point that he was hampered and then pulled up. I think he was already beaten, in my opinion. Personally, I am against you with Brave Man's game. I don't think he necessarily stayed the trip. I think he stayed three mile one furlong perfectly fine, but that final furlong, he lost considerable ground to Galopin de Champ, albeit that horse finished off the race really well. And also Conflated and Protector at seem to make ground as well within the final half of Furlong, despite being off their feet. I think he's now an out three miler and the King George next year will surely be his target. A couple of other horses to mention on Friday. Firstly, Lossy Mouth in the Triumph Hurdle. Super impressive, just a third filly to win the race since the year 2000. We got that bang wrong. Yeah, I think that's probably about the, the biggest error we made all week, really. Um, we got that absolutely bang wrong i thought she was all about speed i couldn't see her staying like that um and didn't have the ideal passage through the race hypotenuse was going off at an angle to the right causing trouble for a number of them and to see paul town instead virtually getting run away with down the hill um, and then she kicked in up the up the hill and, and powered away she looks like a really high class filly willie mullins has got plenty of good two mile uh, options in his in his ranks um so it would be interesting to see what he does with her she looks like she might even have the scope to jump a fence eventually but i expect she'll go mayor's hurdle route next year yeah she's a very talented filly and only at the start of her career other winners on friday include stay away faye who won the albert bartlett uh there was also a shock in the county hurdle with favoir coming out on top all the punters were on dan skelton's other horse pembroke but favoir at 33 to 1 caused a shock impervious gave me a much overdue winner on Friday, fortunately for Cole Murphy, Brian Hayes, really good ride uh, on her, while you gave a couple of phenomenal tips. Now, this is where if you had a hat on, you need to be tipping it because Premier Magic won the Hunter Chase, went off 119 to 1 on SBK 
you gave him a great mention in the anti-post Cheltenham preview podcast that we filmed a week before the festival. And you also tipped Oroko, who won the Martin Pipe with a huge late effort. I presume one of those latter two horses would be your highlight on the undercard today. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I try really hard not to get too carried away. I mean, I do a lot of homework, as as we all do, but you do need a, a slice of luck. You know, Corbett's cross went through the wing. He was still in with a chance. You don't get any luck there. And then you have to say that, you know, I was lucky with Premier Magic that the, the loose horse kept on going straight. If he had gone out to the right, Brad Gibbs was on the outside of him. That would have been difficult. Um, it was nice to be able to say to my wife, see, that's why I dragged you to those Welsh point to points in the middle of the winter, in the in the wind and the cold to see horses like that. Um, and Oroko, I thought, was absolutely phenomenal performance. Aidan Kelly, I mean, I I mentioned that I thought it was a bit disappointing that uh, the, the stable conditional Toby Wynn hadn't got to keep the ride. But you have to say that extra bit of experience was perhaps key because he was niggling away and coming down the hill. And I sort of thought, well, this isn't looking great. But then as they came across the road, he just had a lovely passage up that slightly better strip of ground and stayed really powerful. You have to think he's going to be a really nice horse over further. And there's another horse that looks like your jumper fence too. Yeah, he was really impressive in the closing stages. And no ordinary Joe, the other JP Manor's horse, touched one to 10 in running coming up the hill. So heartbreak for those in running punters that got on at short price there. I think you do need to take full credit for Premier Magic, by the way. Not many people would have put him up. You need to claim that. 119 to 1, you won't get too many of those. Uh, in your career, I'm sure, and I definitely would. Um, the Cheltenham Festival never fails to deliver. There were lovely moments across the whole four days. I know everyone out there will be saying that the best moment was day one, where Honeysuckle won, Constitution Hill won, um, and there was emotional scenes following Honeysuckle's success for Henry de Bromhead, Rachel Blackmore and the whole team. Would that be your highlight of the festival? Yeah, I think it would, TC. I mean, I really enjoyed the Gold Cup today. Um, and I think we have to say we're very fortunate at a time when our sport is perhaps not being painted in the best light, that we've got a horse like Galloping de Champ uh, and Constitution Hill that can perhaps just carry the sport into a into a better place and into a better light. But that hour on Tuesday, and for me, it was actually an hour and a half because I thought the ride Derek Fox gave Corrett Rambler was absolutely sensational and was the sort of ride if it had been driven by ap mccoy back in the day or ruby walsh we would be watching on the replays for years and years to come he's done that two years in a row now there's no fluke about it um i thought that was a brilliant ride constitution hill was just absolutely magical i mean i can't tell you how many times i've watched that back already i mean my wife's getting annoyed now me saying look at this look at this um and then for honeysuckle uh, to take the roof off. I've never been so happy to be wrong about a race in all my life. Um, it just is such a brilliant sport and it set the tempo for what was, I think, one of the best Champion Festivals we've had for many years. Yeah, I would agree. And that Tuesday was phenomenal. Um, it set the bar very high for the remaining three days. One other um, moment that I want to mention was uh, the interview that John Kiley gave to Lydia Hislop on uh, Racing TV following the bumper success for A Dream to Share I've never seen John Kiley be interviewed, which is surprising given how many horses he's trained to win big races throughout his long and illustrious career. But I thought he came across like the perfect and ultimate gentleman. And I love how he gave credit to uh, the Gleasons and to JP McManus and to the whole team about this horse. I thought that was a very touching moment. And he's just a really nice guy, seemingly. Um, OK, Ross, we've gone from the moments now. We've gone from the, the heartache and the heartthrob to now we're getting to the crux of uh, tracker time. What's the one horse that you want to take from the festival looking forward? Well, I, I'm known for breaking the rules on these things, TC. So I, I am going to give you two. I think in the immediacy, Pembroke, don't give up on him. I think you have to uh, take notice that there was an awful lot of confidence from, from the skeleton yard uh, coming out before the race. He was scrappy at four out and then absolutely missed two out. And in a race run at that tempo, that's curtains. Harry Skelton was quite intelligent on him, I thought, and didn't give him a hard time once his chance was gone. I'm sure he'll land one of these big uh, two-mile hurdles at some point. And then another one, a little bit in the in in the guise of uh, Ilete Tom. I think Gusta Wind will be kept as a as a novice for next year. Um, ran really well in the Triumph, off minimal experience. Looks like a nice horse with plenty of progression, and definitely on my radar for the novice hurdles next year. Interesting. Two horses I didn't think you were going to put up. So that's quite good. Put them straight in your tracker if you're watching this right now. Ross is very rarely wrong when it comes to horses to follow. The horse I'm going to give a shout out to is Walking on Air 
who finished fifth in the Potemps final on Thursday. Very inexperienced horse trained by Nicky Henderson. Pretty sure the ground went against him and he didn't jump very well. He was also shuffled back twice at crucial moments in the race, but he plugged on very nicely. And there's a three-mile handicap hurdle at Aintree's Grand National Festival in four weeks that Nicky Henderson tends to run horses that ran in the Potemps final. Mill Green was also in the Potemps final, ran in that Aintree race last year and will probably go there again. But I'd prefer walking on there on, on air if he goes to Aintree this year. And if not, next year, he'll definitely uh, become a really nice prospect and a horse you want to be following. So Cheltenham's over, but racing doesn't stop. So let's provide some Saturday tips. The feature race on Saturday is the Midlands Grand National at Utoxter. SBK are currently 5-1 to one the field, so good luck in that one. If you've been punting in all the handicaps this week, you're used to that by now. But there's also racing from Fontwell, Kempton, Newcastle, Thurles and Wolverhampton. Take it away with your Napa next best, please, Ross. Yeah, I looked at that Midlands Grand National. It's a race I, I like to have a bet in. I've not got a bad record. And I, I took three or four looks at it and thought, no, can't make head nor tail of that. I'll leave it. Thank you very much. So I've gone to Kempton for the nap and the next best. Uh, the nap comes in the 205 and it is a horse that's been in my tracker. So I hope you're right in saying that I can I can find these. It's a horse called Yorksy. Last seen finishing like an absolute steam train over two miles in the bet fair hurdle where Everything that, that, that finished uh, to the fore was raced prominently. He just couldn't go the gallop. Was was a long way back going across the top at, at Newbury. Didn't jump well up the home straight either, but still finished powerfully from the back of the, the last hurdle. That's not the first time he suggested a step up in trip would suit at Cheltenham last season he was finishing powerfully even when he won at Fontwell he was doing all his best work inside the last half furlong so he goes up to two mile five here uh, he's got to show he handles a right-handed track but Fontwell obviously is a figure of eight track so he's had to cope with right-handed bends there hasn't looked a problem um, I think this mark of 126 is way below this horse's ceiling. Uh, I'm pretty excited about him and I hope he'll go very, very close indeed. And then the next best is a bit of a wild swing, really. Uh, Mr. Fisher in the 240 at Kempton. He's been a seriously high class horse, rated 162 at his peak. Um, 11 months ago, he was second, uh, running to a mark of 156 in a grade two chase. But this season has been an absolute washout. Uh, just has barely raised a gallop in any of his three starts since four falling in the uh, handicap chase at Cheltenham at the start of the season. But he's had a wind up and he's had over 80 days off. Shishkin earlier in the season advertised how well Nicky Henderson and his team can run the fine tooth comb through these horses uh, and, and fix their issues. He is still only a nine-year-old, so it's not like he's a veteran trying to get back to form. There still should be years left in him yet. He's now down to a mark of 146. And I think if he's anywhere near back to his best, he'll win this in a common canter. Um, for me, he's a, he's an each way price, but he's a win bet because he'll either win this or his problems aren't fixed and he'll 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 bomb out again. Uh, he was ten to one when I looked. I think there's been a bit of money for him, but I thought he was a an interesting horse um, on a day that I'm going to go quietly. York sees currently six to one in the two hundred five at Kempton, which is Ross's nap. And Mister Fisher is currently nine to one, so a little bit of money, but not too much um, in the two forty at Kempton. Though that price may crash when Mr. Miller gets his cash on down uh, before this goes live. how uh, I mean, tomorrow I thought was really difficult. I've only got one selection, which again breaks the Napa Next Best rule, but given my form in the Napa Next Best this week, that's probably no bad thing. Um, I need to lie down after Cheltenham and I need to focus on my US racing, I think. But we've got one on the all-weather on Saturday, and that is Deed Pole in the 5.30 at Wolverhampton. Now, this three-year-old is a big, physically imposing gelding. Handicap's always going to be the thing for him. He had three runs in novice events, First time up showed nothing. Second time showed something. Third time looked like he wasn't a proper trier in the race. Two runs in handicap since. Super unlucky both times. First time made a real wide move around the bend at Lingfield. Came there looking like he was going to win and just got out battled by a more experienced rival. And then last time out, he was in a five runner race, really inconvenienced by the fact that uh, event turned into a sprint. He plugged on, was only beaten a narrow margin, but he looked like the best horse in the race to me. Now he's stepping up in trip to a mile and a half a furlong, which will definitely suit. And he runs off a lenient mark of 60. So I think Anthony Carson can have a winner with deed pole in the 5.30 Wolverhampton. And he's around 7-2 or 3-1 to one right now. That concludes this mini series. It's been great fun. It's been hard work, but great fun. I hope you've enjoyed the Cheltenham Festival. I hope you've had a profitable week like Ross. He's an absolute screamer, so show him some love uh, in the comments. Whack a like on this. Subscribe as well if you enjoyed our podcast. Our standard podcast, the SBK Betting Podcast, will be back next Thursday. Jess Stafford will be in the host seat. Ross and I providing analysis and tips. Join us then. See you then.